The History of North America podcast is a sweeping historical saga of the United States, Canada, and Mexico, from their deep origins to our present epoch. Join me, Mark Vinette, on this exciting, fascinating, epic journey through time, focusing on the compelling, wonderful, and tragic stories of North America's inhabitants, heroes, villains, leaders, environment, and geography. The History of North America podcast series is an incredible historical adventure that chronicles the thrilling, action-packed tale of a continent. I invite you to come along for the ride. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Before we begin, I'd like to make a quick correction on my pronunciation. Listeners Kofi and Leah pointed out that the pronunciation of some of the Akan phrases I was using was pretty off, to say the least, specifically those involving the KY spelling. Apparently, instead of being pronounced like key, the combination of K and Y actually make a ch sound. So when I say denkira, I should have been saying denchira, and I should have been saying anochie instead of anokie. My bad, and thanks for pointing it out. So, last episode, we covered what was going on among the Ashanti during their time under Denshira domination. We saw the foundation of Kumasi and the subsequent rise of the Oyoko tribe to dominance among the Ashanti elite, and finally charted the early life of the Oyoko prince Ose Tutu, from being a hostage in the Denshira court and his subsequent escape to the kingdom of Aquamu. This episode, Ose Tutu will return to Kumasi and begin building the army that will serve him in his fight against the Denshira. Season 3, Episode 4, A New Ashanti Army When Ose Tutu returned to his home in Kumasi, he found his city in disarray. Not only had the city, as well as the greater Ashanti region, been crushed under the increasingly heavy hand of Denshira tribute payments, but the city was still militarily threatened by the invading Dorma people to the west. To make matters worse, the political status quo in Kumasi wasn't looking so great either. The last Kumasi Hene, Yaboa, had been killed in the skirmish with the Dorma, and the now empty throne of Kumasi sent the city into a form of political paralysis. Kumasi, which had housed the most powerful tribe in the Ashanti alliance against the Dorma, was a linchpin that held the alliance together. And if it wasn't for Ose Tutu's timely return from his exile in Aquamu, it's possible that this alliance could have fallen apart altogether, and that the kings of the other cities of the Ashanti city-states would have gone their own way. But Ose Tutu did return from his exile in 1695, so the makeshift alliance against the Dorma was safe, at least for now. However, to Ose Tutu, merely maintaining this alliance was simply not going to be enough to win the war against the Dorma. Remember, the alliance had been at full strength the last time the two sides had clashed, and while the battle had stopped the Dorma advance, this stalemate came at a great cost. And, yeah, typically when you have to suffer significant losses just to force a tie on the battlefield, things aren't looking so great for you overall. Not to mention, if the Alliance did manage to defeat the Dorma, there was still another problem on the horizon. The Denshira Empire was, for now, distracted with another chapter of the near-constant wars that they were fighting in the south of their country. But these wars wouldn't last forever. To the Denshira, Ose Tutu was still a wanted fugitive, and when they eventually found out that he was not only back in Kumasi, but that he was raising and commanding armies, yeah, they would come knocking at the first opportunity. So while the Ashanti were struggling to even fight off the Dorma, who at this time fought with the same traditional tactics of sword and shield that the Ashanti fought with, any battle against the well-armed, disciplined, and highly organized Denshira army would surely end in disaster. So, not only did Ose Tutu have to raise an army capable of defeating the Dorma, he also had the much harder task of raising an army to defeat the Denshira. He needed to build an army that incorporated the same modern tactics, organization, and firearm technology that the Denshira had at their disposal if he was going to stand any chance. And, fortunately for Ose, he had an ace up his sleeve. Remember, Ose Tutu had just spent his exile in Aquamu. And Aquamu practiced the same, or probably an even more refined version of the same modern organized warfare as the Denshira. So, Ose Tutu had learned a thing or two about how the system works during his time in Aquamu. More importantly, he had also brought with him a small contingent of Aquamu bodyguards. These bodyguards, well-trained officers in the Aquamu military, were perfect for the role of what we would today call military advisors. Their job was to transform the Ashanti army, or, more accurately said, Ashanti armies, from a mosaic of various local conscript forces led by warrior noble elites into a unified army of trained soldiers led by professional officers. 
Not only that, but they would have to drill this army in a completely new strategic doctrine, one infinitely more advanced and convoluted than the traditional ways of fighting. Implementing these reforms would be a Herculean task. The first aspect of military reforms that these officers went about implementing was the transformation of the Ashanti conscript army into a real force of soldiers. If you've ever talked to someone who's acted as a military advisor, they'll tell you about some of the difficulties that come with training conscript soldiers. Conscripts, as the name implies, are people who have been conscripted. They are not in the army by choice, but are instead called to the front by force. Or in this case, a nobleman of whatever happened to be the most powerful Ashanti tribe in your region will see you tending to your crop or whatever you're doing and say some version of, hey, I'm raising an army. Join or you will face some extremely negative consequences, up to and including death. While conscription is an incredibly effective way of getting large quantities of men into your army, the quality of these men does tend to suffer. For starters, the conscripts, understandably, don't want to be there. Not only are they not given a choice in the matter, but army life sucks, especially in the turn of the 17th century. You are almost certainly not receiving any sort of pay. Heck, you're lucky to even receive a sufficient amount of food. Ghana is incredibly hot and humid, and there's no such thing as air conditioning. Mosquitoes are everywhere, so if one person in the camp gets malaria, everyone in the camp is going to get malaria. Camps don't necessarily dispose of waste in the most sanitary way either, so that's another vector of disease just waiting to break out. Oh yeah, and all this disease around means that basically any battlefield injury is almost guaranteed to get infected, which makes you basically a goner. And that's not even to mention the psychological effects of Ashanti army life. You're away from your family for months on end, and you have to deal with the constant threat of death, not only on the battlefield, but also from the rampant problems of disease in the camp. You likely had no prior experience in combat, and your training has also likely been minimal if you got any at all, so you have no idea what's waiting for you once you get out on the battlefield. You might see how morale could become an endemic problem with conscript militaries at the time. The soldiers are suffering both physically and psychologically, and then that same noble who pulled you into this mess by conscripting you comes to you on the day of battle and tells you to give it all and fight to the death. Well, we can see where this is going. Low morale in conscripts leads to numerous problems on the battlefield. Defensive lines broke early, men deserted in droves, and retreats were desperate and disorderly. So, one of the first changes that Ose Tutu and his military advisors made to the Ashanti army was the promise that soldiers would be paid at the end of their service. And I cannot understate just how much of a positive effect this one reform must have had on the morale of the Ashanti army. Sure, soldiers were still suffering from the bad conditions of camp life, but at least now they were receiving something for it. Additionally, this promise of payment also gave soldiers something concrete to fight for. Unlike conscripts, who are basically coerced into serving, paid soldiers have an actual incentive to win the battle. After all, if the battle turns into a disastrous defeat and the Kumasi Hene is deposed, who's going to pay you? So yeah, paying soldiers did a great deal to improve morale. Due to the introduction of the promise of pay for military service, a degree of professionalism would become a growing trend in the Ashanti army, with this trend becoming more concrete over time. While the bulk of the army's manpower in Ose Tutu's era remained peasant conscripts, a small but growing minority would be filled by full-time soldiers who didn't even have a job beyond training and drilling in combat. And, obviously, this permanent training made these soldiers the most effective fighters in the Ashanti army. However, the advisors' efforts to improve morale didn't end there. As the advisors began the actual training of Ashanti soldiers, much of the curriculum explicitly focused on improving morale on the battlefield. They demanded that the Ashanti soldiers regularly recited the motto, If I move forward, I die. If I retreat, I die. Better to move forward and die in the mouth of battle. During practice combat exercises, in which Ashanti soldiers simulated battlefield conditions, the advisors stood closely behind each side's lines during the drill. They carried whips, which they weren't afraid to use on any soldier who even looked like they were considering retreat. And, of course, when the army was eventually put into action, officers would be placed in the exact same position behind the army, ensuring that any retreating soldiers would immediately meet harsh discipline. As well as improving the army's morale, the advisors also sought to introduce modern Akomu tactics into the Ashanti army. This new system, as stated earlier, was infinitely more complex than the traditional method of Akan warfare. And honestly, it was one of the most complex systems of military organization anywhere in the world at the time. The strategic doctrine of the Akwamu prioritized mobility, flexibility, and encirclement. 
closely resembling later tactics called the hammer and anvil. In short, the idea of this strategy was that one part of the army would ferociously attack the enemy's center, the anvil, ensuring that the enemy would not be able to reposition their forces without risking a collapse in the middle of their line. Then, mobile forces on the outskirts of the battlefield, the hammer, would rapidly encircle the enemy, placing the Ashanti army in a tactically advantageous situation. And, as we'll see, every part of the Ashanti army in some way contributed to the so-called hammer and anvil strategy. The new Ashanti army was divided into seven components, each of which contributed to this tactic of encirclement. The first of these units was called the Ekwansrafo, Chui for something like limited technique, I think. I can't find any good Chui translation services online, so I basically have to take the words of the books I'm reading on this. If you can speak Chui, please inform me of all the pronunciations and translations I'm butchering, and just send me an email and help me out, I'd really appreciate it. Anyways, the Ekwansrafo functioned as the scouts of the Ashanti army, moving slightly ahead of the main force to gauge terrain as well as the enemy's movements. However, unlike traditional military scouts, the Ekwansrofo actually went a little further, and played an important role not only in informing their own army, but also to mislead the enemy. They often carried poles with hooks on them, which they would use to jiggle foliage to give the impression that a group of men was moving through it. They also actively sabotaged enemy armies, carving false paths and bushes to slow their movement, or occasionally sniping at the enemy army before rapidly retreating. In this early rendition of the Ashanti army, these scouts were primarily recruited from conscripts who had previous experience as hunters, as this career gave them practice in tracking, stalking, and moving quickly through the dense foliage of the forest. In later periods, these hunters would be replaced with professionally trained scouts, but for now, they serve as a great example of how Ose Tutu and his advisors made clever use of his soldiers' pre-existing skills to enhance his army. Now, after the scouts, we can discuss the actual army itself. The main army consisted of five of the army's seven components, and was, well, the actual meat, so to say, of the Ashanti military. The first part of the main Ashanti army, that is, the part that marched at the front of formations, was called the Chwafu, or Forward Guard. The forward guard, which consisted of the best trained and most thoroughly equipped soldiers in the Ashanti army, mostly the professional soldiers mentioned earlier, had the job of being the first soldiers to engage the enemy at the start of a battle. They were meant to apply such pressure on the front lines that the enemy couldn't move or reposition their army. And for this to work, the pressure from the forward guard had to be constant and intense. Hence why the best troops were placed here. But they weren't entirely on their own. Behind the forward guard was the main body, which basically functioned as the army's strategic reserve, reinforcing any part of the army that needed support at any given moment. In addition to providing support to the forward guard, the main body was also at all times ready to support the four wings of the army. These wings consisted of groups of men on the left and right flanks of the army, with two of the wings closer and two of the wings further away from the center of battle. Unlike in other armies, where flanking maneuvers were performed by cavalry, the Ashanti instead used fast-moving infantry as their flanking unit. After all, the wooded terrain of southern Ghana made moving horses cumbersome and slow, so they were never really used in a major sense by any armies in the forest region. The wings would, as the enemy was preoccupied with fighting the forward guard, advance around each of the flanks in order to fully or partially encircle the enemy. If the enemy recognized what was happening and tried to fight their way out, the center wings would engage the enemy, while the far wings would continue to fan out and complete the encirclement. To aid with this, each of the four wings were commanded by a different officer, and independent decision-making among these officers was actively encouraged. Behind the entire army lay the Chiedom, literally translating to Grace in the Back, but more appropriately called the Rear Guard. As their literal translation implies, this section served as a saving grace of the army tasked with preventing enemy encirclements and serving as an emergency reserve of men, just in case the main body of the army ran out. So yes, the Ashanti army didn't have just one backup manpower reserve, but also a backup backup reserve, which just goes to show you how thoroughly the Ashanti military was planned out for the worst case scenario. And the last and smallest combat ready section of the army was the Gyase, Chui for safety. This part of the army functioned as the personal bodyguards of officers and nobles on the battlefield, ensuring that, even in the worst of defeats, these irreplaceably valuable people would not be killed in the fighting. And it's easy to see what motivated the creation of this section, considering how the King of Kumasi had been killed during the last major battle fought by the Ashanti Alliance. Yeah, the value of this position seems pretty important. However, while the personal bodyguards were the last combat-ready part of the army we've discussed, there's one final part of the army that we haven't touched on yet. This section, unlike the rest of the army, 
was fully unique to the Ashanti system, rather than an import from the Aquamu. These were the dedicated support brigades, composed of engineers, craftsmen, medics, foragers, and military police. The support brigades followed the Ashanti army during campaigns. The engineers served both important roles during regular movement and, later, during sieges. They built bridges across rivers, carved paths for the army to walk through, drained water to prevent mosquito breeding and malaria, built fortifications before defensive engagements, and constructed shelters when the army stopped for camp. They also probed enemy defensive structures for weaknesses, and advised army officers on the best way to penetrate fortifications. Craftsmen followed the army repairing and manufacturing weapons. They were also tailed by a team of medics, who treated the wounded, prevented infections, and sanitized campgrounds to prevent outbreaks of disease. Medical knowledge in Ghana was significantly more advanced than you might expect. With relatively modern practices like inoculation and even an early form of germ theory before the idea was mainstream in Europe. If you'd like to learn more about Ashanti medical practices, as well as the immense impact that these practices would have on the medicine of the Caribbean and even the United States, including some of the first vaccination campaigns, you can do so by supporting the show on Patreon and listening to our premium episode on pre-colonial Akan medical knowledge. Me and my editor put in a combined 30 plus hours of work each week into making this podcast happen. So your support on Patreon is incredibly valuable in keeping us going. And to those of you already supporting, thank you. Anyways, while the engineers, craftsmen, and medics were usually professional, free people, the same could not necessarily be said for other members of the army's support brigade. The porters, who carried supplies, and foragers, who supplemented supply lines by finding food in the forest, were usually slaves. As we'll see throughout this podcast, unfortunately, like everyone else on Earth at the time, Slavery was a firmly ingrained institution in Ashanti society, and that extended to the army as well. Keeping these slaves in line, as well as preventing insubordination and ensuring compliance from local civilian populations, was the job of the military police, or Ankobia. While the army's officers were tasked with maintaining discipline and good behavior within their own ranks, the Ankobia were tasked with maintaining discipline and good behavior among the officers, watching the watchmen, so to say. And with that, you have a complete picture of the Ashanti army. So, as you can see, the concept of Osetutu's new Ashanti army was a well-oiled war machine, one of the most bureaucratized and professionalized armies not only in Africa, but in the entire world at the time. But, of course, this army didn't come to life overnight. The training, theorizing, and organization of manpower would take decades to implement. So, by the time that war with the Dorma would come, The Ashanti army was just barely beginning to implement these reforms to become a modern professional army. And while Ashanti officers were now armed with the knowledge of the Aquamu way of war, it would take a little bit longer before most of them were actually trained with, you know, firearms, an important aspect of Aquamu tactics. So when war came with the Dorma, the Ashanti were an army trained in modern schools of warfare, but still using the traditional Akrafena and bows as equipment. Despite this, however, the newly disciplined and increasingly professionalized Ashanti army showed some immediate results on the battlefield. When the Dorma invaded again in another attempt to take Kumasi, the Ashanti army repelled them successfully, driving them out of the Ashanti region altogether. So, even in this early beta-test version of the army, so to say, it was clear that the new Ashanti army was a more capable force than the armies of the old alliance. However, while the Dorma were certainly not pushovers, Repelling their attacks would be far from the greatest test of the new Ashanti army. To the south, the fighting between the Denshira and their neighbors came to a lull, and so the Denshira finally had an opportunity to turn north. They had known for a while that their escaped fugitive, Ose Tutu, had returned to Kumasi and taken the title of king, and they were not happy about it. So, with everything quiet on their southern front, the Denshira Hene sent his army north to show Ose Tutu what happened when you defied him. However, spoiler alert for, uh, history, this war would not work out as the Denshira Hene hoped. Join us next episode when, on the battlefield of Feijase, the Ashanti Empire is born. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then I'd encourage you to support the show. This can be done by a monetary donation to our Patreon, which can be found on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com. By giving the show a review on iTunes, 
or by sharing the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested. This episode, like all of them, is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Raul Kanakia, Ayofagbamie, Kevin Johnson, Sarah Mpenza, Sean Burke, and Morgan Blackmore, among others. Thank you for your support and your help in making sure that this show keeps happening.